Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Well, we talk a lot about hormones on this podcast, but I have one hormone that I haven't talked about yet and I'm super excited to do so. We're going to be talking about adrenaline and specifically adrenaline dominance today. My guest I'm very excited about is Dr. Michael Platt. He is a board certified in internal medicine. He is known internationally as an expert in bioidentical hormones. He is considered by many to be the world world's expert on the use of high-dose progesterone cream. He is the author of The Miracle of Bioidentical Hormones that has six literary awards, Adrenaline Dominance, which I have just finished reading, five literary awards, The Platt Protocol for Hormone Balancing, a Wellness Manual for Doctors. So welcome, Dr. Platt. I'm so <coughs> happy to have you here. Well, I'm glad to be here. Yes. Uh, okay. So adrenaline dominance, I'm sure nobody's heard of this. The adrenaline. When I heard you on a podcast, I was just, I shared it with everybody I knew. Listen to this <laughs> podcast. This is so great because it's something that made so much sense when I heard you talk about it. So maybe you could just explain what is adrenaline and specifically adrenaline dominance. Well, <clears throat> adrenaline is, uh, is both a hormone as well as a neurotransmitter. And most people have heard of adrenaline and they think of it as the fight or flight hormone. But what's interesting uh, is that the major, the major uh, purpose, function of adrenaline is not, be, not to uh, get us out of danger. The main function of adrenaline is to make sure the brain has enough fuel. Um, the um, adrenaline raises sugar levels for the brain through a process called gluconeogenesis. And, um, and so anytime the body detects that the brain <clears throat> is running out of fuel, and that's when people get sleepy, you know, when you take sugar away from the brain, they, they call that hypoglycemia. But anytime the body detects a low sugar level, it puts out adrenaline to raise sugar levels. And this can go on all day and all night. And, uh, and, and this whole thing about adrenaline, it is completely off the radar, yeah. but, but it's a very powerful hormone and a very powerful neurotransmitter. And it's the underlying cause of many conditions that are actually felt to be incurable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, can you tell some of the symptoms of adrenaline dominance? Well, yes. Um, the first um, symptom would be people have trouble sleeping, either falling asleep or staying asleep. And some people toss and turn, some people have restless leg syndrome, some people grind their teeth or clench their jaw. Some people get up at night to urinate. This is all adrenaline. And other symptoms that people might experience, uh, they may have a lot of tension in the back of the neck, which can actually cause tinnitus and, and headaches. Uh, people with a lot of adrenaline have cold hands and cold feet, um, which is always blamed on the low thyroid, but actually it's adrenaline. It's the number one cause, in fact, probably the only cause of anxiety. And it can, it's a cause of depression and um, it can cause pain because it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a cause of fibromyalgia. It, and <clears throat> people with ADHD can, can also look toward adrenaline as the cause of that and bipolar disorders and addiction. And I didn't, you know, it goes on and on. Yeah, yeah. Irritable, ir, irritable bowel syndrome is another symptom. And Wow. So like, so uh, the, uh, first of all, I can just go check, check, check off the first few that you talked about. That's what made me think, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, and we can talk about that later because I've actually been implementing a lot of the things that you suggest and it's working. But um, those are complaints that I hear every day from women specifically. I mean, I don't work with men, so I, but women, it's like, oh, I've got anxiety, depression are always the top, top two, you know, anxiety, depression, weight gain, um, you can't insomnia. That's what I hear all the time. I understand. Uh, yeah. And what's funny is we usually, I mean, you hear so much about cortisol because cortisol and adrenaline, they are very similar when it comes to like too high cortisol mimics a lot of the stuff that high adrenaline seems to, or is it that we're misdiagnosing that? Well, actually, um, you know, when the body releases adrenaline, it creates stress. It's probably the number one cause, if not the only cause of stress, is adrenaline. And when the body is under stress, then it releases cortisol to deal with the stress. Mm -hmm. and, and what's interesting about cortisol, just like adrenaline, it also raises sugar levels through a different process called glycogenolysis. And, and a lot of this occurs right around 2.30 in the morning. 
Uh, and a lot of people wake up at that time to urinate because adrenaline gets people that urge to urinate. And, but if you keep in mind that the body's putting out adrenaline to raise sugar levels for the brain, and then the body is now putting out cortisol to deal with the stress from the adrenaline, which is also raising sugar levels. And this is going on while people are lying in bed. And the whole thing about sugar, as you know, if, if you don't burn it up, the body stores it. So it doesn't matter whether you're eating sugar or if the body's making sugar. If the sugar is there, it's going to get stored in your fat cells as fat. And this goes on while people are sleeping. And I suspect it's the, the number one cause of weight gain. And nobody talks about this. No. Because no. can you explain its effect on insulin? Well, you know, as, as soon as the body, either you eat sugar or the body makes sugar, then, then the body produces insulin. And insulin is the hormone that puts sugar into cells, uh, either for storage or for whatever. And, you know, and insulin is what puts on weight around the middle. You know, when people, you know, that, that's insulin putting sugar into your fat cells around the waist. And, uh, and what's nice about, and we're going to be talking about progesterone, because mm -hmm. that's a hormone that not only blocks adrenaline, it also blocks insulin. So it's an incredibly important hormone when it comes to weight. And I have an interesting question for you that I don't think you talked in, about in your book, but okay. we, we hear that term adrenaline junkie because right. adrenaline <clears throat> is highly, it's a highly addictive hormone, isn't it? Because it makes, it's a feel good hormone, even though it's causing these issues, do we not seek out, like once we start getting that adrenaline payoff, we seek it out? Some people do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but keep, but keep in mind that adrenaline is also raising sugar levels, which mm, people, very addictive. <laughs> and, and but what's but if you want to go one step further, you know, you people get involved with drugs and alcohol. Yeah. And and the number one cause of of drug of, of people getting addicted is excess adrenaline. They're just trying to relax. They're just trying to chill out. And which brings us to the whole concept about creative type people. Yes. And, and creative people have the most adrenaline. And all you have to do is look at the music industry and look at the drugs and alcohol, yeah. or even in Hollywood, the drugs and alcohol. Um, <clears throat> and, and nobody ever, you know, a lot of, you know, rehab centers and detox centers, uh, you know, they treat people, but they don't deal with the cause of why they get involved with drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Of course, they have no incentive to, you know, they want repeat customers. As they yes. Do. But anyway, but um, so the. So that's another thing that excess adrenaline can be responsible for is addiction. Yeah. And because the creative brain, you say in your book, it, because it's always going, and I can relate to that too, it uses up more fuel. It does. You're absolutely right. It, um, <clears throat> the brain of a creative person uses a fuel in about three hours. And once that fuel is used up, then the body puts out more adrenaline to raise fuel again, you know, so it, and this goes, and so adrenaline peaks at 2.30 in the morning, you know, when the brain is out of fuel, essentially. Right. Yes. So. Crazy. Now, I know that cortisol will affect how the thyroid functions. It will affect progesterone levels. What kind of impact does high adrenaline have on the other hormones in the body? I mean, besides cortisol, like, does it affect our thyroid function? Is it affecting, is it depleting the progesterone or raising estrogen levels? These, I have to say, this is actually an excellent question. Thank um, you. <clears throat> adrenaline is a stimulant. Thyroid is a stimulant. When people have a lot of adrenaline, they don't tolerate thyroid. And so one of the functions of cortisol, it's an antithyroid hormone. And the, and the body is releasing cortisol when you have a lot of adrenaline because dealing with the stress, you know, from too much adrenaline. So yes, um, excess adrenaline does affect other hormones. Wow. Uh, and will it bl actually block the, how thyroid's being utilized inside the cell, like cortisol? Well, well the, um, no, adrenaline doesn't, no, all it does is <laughs> make it so that be very hard to get people in thyroid balance until you lower their adrenaline. I see. Right. Because, yeah. <clears throat> because they will not tolerate the right amount of thyroid. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, I like that. Cause I, I, there's so much of that right now with thyroid, thyroid, like people will get on thyroid medication and it, they don't feel it or it's not working properly for them, even if it's T3, T4. And it's just, it's like, it just doesn't work. 
there's a number of reasons for for that actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, the um, there, I, I don't know if you want to talk about thyroid, but um, yeah, I do. But, we have lots of thyroid people listen to this podcast, so <laughs> okay. So 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 why don't we why don't we teach them something that their doctors don't know? Yes. Uh, okay. You know, <clears throat> when it comes to an underactive thyroid, there are basically two different types. Uh, the most common type or the most well-known type is primary hypothyroidism. And this is where the, own, the thyroid just doesn't produce enough thyroid. And an example of this is, is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Okay. But there's another type of thyroid called secondary hypothyroidism. And this is where the pituitary doesn't put out, put out enough TSH, which is thyroid-stimulating hormone. And and why this is important to realize is that a lot of doctors, if they're going to do a thyroid test, all they're going to do is look at TSH. Yeah. And, but if they have secondary hypothyroidism, they're going to have a low TSH and doctors will think they have plenty of thyroid. Mm -hmm. so, um, so again, when having thyroid testing done, a TSH is important, but so is looking at, at a free T3 and a free T4 level. Those are the three primary tests that need to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that, I mean, that happened to me. I was undiagnosed, you know, misdiagnosed basically for 10 years because my doc in Canada, they are only allowed as a doctor to test TSH. Okay. And only if there's a problem with that TSH, are they allowed to test T3 and T4. So I it went on and on and on until finally I was begged my doctor and she lied on the form and said that it looked like I had a goiter and that's why she needed the T3, T4 checked. And my T3 was really, really low and my T4 and TSH were totally normal. It's just, and, just like, yeah. So you were, you were not converting your T4 into T3, yeah. which, is, which is one of the effects of adrenaline, by the way. Um, again, because the adrenaline causes cortisol as an anti-thyroid hormone prevents the conversion of T4 into T3 and causes T3 to, to convert into reverse T3, which has no activity. Which was what was happening. Yeah. 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 So adrenaline, high adrenaline will always raise cortisol. Is that correct then? <clears throat> I think that's a fair thing to say. Yeah. yeah. And then what about when somebody starts to go into like dipping with their cortisol levels? Like if they've got low cortisol blood tests on a blood test um, or, or saliva, at what is there a point? Is there adrenaline still going to be? Because I've heard that too, that when you are in, you know, adrenal insufficiency, adrenal fatigue, if some people call it, that that's why some people can't sleep because <clears throat> the adrenaline is pumping on when you're in the middle of the night instead of the cortisol. Is that, is that true? <laughs> well, l let me clarify that for you. Okay. Okay. First off, <clears throat> the, the term adrenal fatigue, uh, we're talking about a non-existing condition. There is no such thing as adrenal fatigue. And the only reason it even exists is because it's a naturopath diagnosis. And, and the reason why in naturopaths diagnosis, they do what are called saliva tests. And the problem with saliva tests, uh, it's saliva, uh, the thing about adrenaline, it's, it's a survival hormone. And as a survival hormone, it cuts off blood supply to areas of the body that are not needed for survival. And that includes the salivary glands. It's the classic area cuts off blood supply to the intestines. And that's where irritable bowel syndrome comes from. But, and that's where the cold hands and cold feet come from. But, but because it cuts off blood supply to the salivary glands, um, the hormones don't get into the saliva. So when they do a saliva test, they have a low cortisol. And based on the low cortisol in the saliva, they diagnose adrenal fatigue. If they did a blood test, they would find the cortisol level is elevated. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so, and the whole approach to adrenal fatigue is to raise cortisol levels when they're already high to begin with. Mm -hmm. In fact, they even put patients on Cortep, which is cortisol. Yeah. And that's not a happy hormone. So. No, but on, most doctors will only, like if you try to get your cortisol tested with a doctor, they'll just do it once in, the, in like a snapshot in the middle, whenever you just happen to go for that blood work. So... Or do you suggest having it done like four times throughout the day, kind of to see what that cortisol rhythm's doing? Because sometimes people have lots in the morning and none at night. And well, I hear that, but but if you're only going to have one 
time they're gonna do it. A morning cortisol before 9 a.m. Uh, is the best test there is for excess adrenaline. And the reason for that is that remember adrenaline is coming out at 2.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. causing stress, and then the body puts out cortisol. So, so when people have excess adrenaline, that morning cortisol before nine o'clock is, is usually the best indication if you, if you need a lab test uh, to look at, uh, at a high adrenaline. So there's no actual test for adrenaline? Well, there is, but it's simpler just to do a, a cortisol test. So um, test morning cortisol before 9 a.m. if possible, and if it's high, then you likely have high adrenaline. Okay, now here's the thing. Um, let me, <laughs> when it comes to what's called a no normal range for cortisol, keep, keep in mind that the people that they use to determine normal levels were medical students because they're available in hospitals so they can. Okay. And, and, and all doctors have increased adrenaline. You know, they all have ADHD, which is okay. So, um, so the normal range is actually high to begin with. So, but. Uh, but anything over 14 should be considered elevated, even though the range goes up to 19.4 in, in some labs and 23.2 in another. But anything above 14 should be considered high. Yes. Okay. That's good to know. Um, I, I noticed in your books that uh, you're so open-minded about not just the medical side of things, but you talk a lot about the energetic causes of things uh, specifically like fibromyalgia it could is you, you what you noticed <clears throat> in practice is that it was a suppression of anger so is was this just because this is a these are things that you just started seeing in your practice or did somebody teach you this actually um my teachers were my patients yeah, yeah. <clears throat> if you look at my books you'll notice there are no references in my books because everything i've learned i've learned from talking to my patients Mm -hmm. And um, and the whole thing about adren adrenaline is an anger hormone. It's, it's where road rage comes from. So needless to say, people with uh, fibromyalgia, which is which is basically caused by excess adrenaline, have anger issues. And yeah. and they you know they keep the muscle tense. They build up lactic acid in the muscle, which causes the pain. And because they keep the muscle tense twenty four hours a day, they use up a tremendous amount of energy, which is why they always feel fatigued. Um, but what, what's nice about fibromyalgia, and there are about 10 million people in this country with fibromyalgia, and basically every one of them have been told there's no cure for it. Mm -hmm. But doctors say that about just about everything. Thank but anyway, the, um, but I tell people with fibromyalgia, if they're going to have chronic pain, it's the best condition they can have because it's the easiest pain condition to get rid of. Wow. Yeah. So many people would be shocked to hear that and very happy, I'm sure. But yeah, I think it's so great that you have this medical mind, you're a trained doctor, but yet you're so open-minded to the energy side of things and, and how that ties into it. And you talk a lot about that in your book. I, I used to do <clears throat> body work, um, okay. something called rolfing. Have you heard of rolfing? I have. Yeah. Yes. In California, I would think so. Yeah. And Ida Rolf, the woman that developed it, talked a lot about how people store stuff in their body. And one of the things that she said that in 17 years of me doing that body work, I saw countless people with this issue, which was very, very painful legs always meant they were storing anger. Interesting. But <clears throat> that sounds like what they call restless leg syndrome. Mm. And that you can get rid of in 30 seconds, by the way. Um, and same thing with cramps in the calves and cramps in the feet also. You get yeah. rid of it in about 30 seconds. Um, and we'll talk about that later. Yes. So yeah. let's, well, let's talk about that because I think this is really neat. Uh, how, I don't know how you, how you figured this out, <laughs> which was that progesterone helped to mitigate the effects of adrenaline. Well, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I first got involved with hormones after my, my mother died of breast cancer. And this is back in around 1980. Okay. And she, she was only 61. And right after she died, I realized it came to it. You know, I realized that I had inherited her hormones. You know, men and women had the identical hormones, different levels, but the same hormones. And, um, and I realized that because she had breast cancer, that she did not have enough progesterone to protect her. And at the same time, she had a, some weight on around the middle, 
uh, only around the middle. And the only thing that does that is insulin. And I'm, I was thinking to myself, if she's low in progesterone, she has a problem with insulin, maybe the two are connected. And, and the thing is that I used to have to slap my face when I was driving, trying to keep my eyes open, I, you know, from a low blood sugar. And, and I started using progesterone cream. And ever since then, I've never gotten sleepy in a car, ever. And so even though there's nothing in the literature that says that, that progesterone blocks insulin, I know, that, I know that it does. And so that's started my love affair with hormones, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so I tried to learn as much as I could about, you know, bioidentical hormones. And, and it's, it's been quite a journey. Mm-hmm. But, but once you sit, you know, I had the advantage of, of spending about two hours with, with each of my patients. And, and I was taught that 90% of a diagnosis is just sitting down talking to a patient. And I'm sorry to say that doctors don't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, they, you know, I don't know if it's, they don't have the time or the inclination, but um, I mean, theoretically, when a, when a patient is sitting in a, in, a wait, in, a, in a treatment room and a doctor walks in, within 18 seconds, he knows what drug he's going to prescribe. And so, but, and it's all, you know, and so doctors are not trained to treat the cause of illness. They're just trained to give out band-aids mm-hmm. and um, which might explain why the United States is on the bottom of the list of healthcare of, mm-hmm. of all civilized countries. We have the mm-hmm. highest incidence of diabetes and strokes and cancer and heart disease and even infant mortality were on the bottom of the list. So anyway, mm-hmm. so, um, but it's very rewarding getting people well and doctors unfortunately don't see it very often. You know, no, I think it's, I think we have to get to the place where we no longer look to our doctor for that. It just amazes me that, you know, 95% of the public still counts on their doctor to have the answer to their illness. And it's like, mm, they have a place, they're very important, but they are the people that you go to for the band aid, the quick fix, or maybe for something <clears throat> life saving, like uh, open heart surgery or something like that. But it's not getting to the root of the problem and it's better to just say that's not what the that that, that doctors are for it's that's they're not going to do that they're not going to tell you to change your diet or to take a supplement in most cases you're right about that and it it, it almost sounds like you're suggesting this is not a perfect world <laughs> i am oh okay uh, the, uh, yeah, doctors are not trained to treat the cause of illness and they're not trained about hormones. No. Um, yeah. Let's be very clear about that. You guys, um, how much do you get in medical school when it comes to hormones? I'd say close to zero. Okay. Even, though, even though hormones control every system in the body is controlled by hormones, doctors don't get any training in hormones. And, and a lot of this, you know, is that, you know, big pharma, you know, basically controls what doctors learn in medical school. And the last thing they want is for doctors to know how to get people well. Right. And, you know, so we, so the, so the, the entity in charge of, of health in this country has no interest in people being healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, they control the medical boards, they control, you know, the FDA, they control medical school, they, they, they control medicine. So. Did you learn anything about bioidentical hormones? Never, <clears throat> never no. heard the term. No, I didn't think no. so. No. Right. Explain the difference between hormone replacement therapy and bioidentical hormones because i know that it is still a very common practice to prescribe hormone synthetic hormone replacement therapy premarin provera or whatever it is prim pro prim pro premarin Um, i just spoke to a client the other day who i was insisting go and get herself on some progesterone cream and she said great i'm i you know i have an appointment at this women's uh menopause clinic and i'm like perfect that'll be awesome they'll know what to do and she went in and they said a your blood sugar's fine even though she was insulin resistant oh well don't worry about that right now uh then they gave her uh, horm- uh, they gave her Prempro and said, and she said, well, what about bioidentical hormones? Well, that's not right. Re- we don't know. No, no well, that's not regulated. Uh, you know, see you later. We don't know anything about that. Here you go. See ya. <clears throat> that's kind of scary. Um, Very scary. I was like, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, hormone replacement therapy just is what it sounds like. It, it's replacing hormones. 
Uh, and as people get older, their hormone levels change. <clears throat> now, bioidentical hormones, what that means, uh, bioidentical hormones are the I I identical hormone that the body produces. And the advantage of a bioidentical hormone is that hormones uh, work by attaching, <clears throat> attaching to receptor sites on cells. And it's only the bioidentical hormones that attack, attach directly to the receptor sites. Um, the, now, the, now, the thing about Premarin, it's a natural hormone, mm -hmm. but it's natural for horses, it's not natural for humans. And if women really knew how they, how they uh, manufactured Premarin, they would never use it. <laughs> it's like, it well, it's not so much that they keep the, the horses in stalls 24 hours a day attached to a urine, urine collecting system, but these are pregnant mares, you know, pregnant Premarin is pregnant mares urine. And, and I, I hate to tell you this, but they, they have no use for the colts when they're born. So <gasps> No. Yes. Oh. Abs absolutely. So, <clears throat> so anyway. And so th those ones don't attach to the receptors. Not, not, not directly. Um, and, and they're, t you know, and to, to me, estrogen is almost a toxic hormone anyway. It, mm -hmm. um, the, um, you know, estrogen is what causes cramps and PMS and breast tenderness and <clears throat> causes fibroids and endometriosis and polycystic ovaries and causes gallbladder disease and asthma and migraine headaches and phlebitis and blood clots and rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. It's a toxic hormone and it causes six different cancers. Right. And we're talking, and here we're talking about a bioidentical estrogen, by the right. way, that right. causes all this. So just because something's bioidentical doesn't make it safe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, now the nice thing about progesterone, progesterone helped prevent every one of these conditions I just mentioned, and um, and it's getting getting to the point where when women have had a hysterectomy, and they go for hormone replacement therapy, if they see a gynecologist, they're only going to be getting estrogen even though you know, they seem to forget they have breasts so they can get breast cancer from the estrogen they're replacing. Anyway, so um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of estrogen. I'll have no. to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. What about when a woman is uh, through perimenopause, she stopped her bleeding, or even it shows up on labs that her estrogen, estradiol, estriol is quite, is really low. Right, what okay. then? Is there a place for it then? Well, there is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, usually the only estrogen I feel comfortable with, with is estriol. Um, estriol is the only estrogen that's good for vaginal dryness, the yep. only one. And it's the only estrogen that doesn't cause cancer. So if I'm going to use estrogen, that's the, you know, bioidentical estriol is what I, as a cream, is what I would recommend. Right. Um, uh, now, women that are extremely thin, who have no fat cells, they can get away with using some estradiol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but as long as the women have fat cells, they're still making estradiol. Right. Yeah. Good. That's a very good point to know. So how is it that we use progesterone to mitigate the adrenaline? <laughs> well, um, one of the nice things about progesterone is it actually blocks adrenaline. Yeah, that's um, amazing. Yeah. Well, it's mostly, you know, first of all, most doctors and most people think that progesterone is a woman's hormone. And they lose sight of the fact that men and women have the identical hormones, different levels, but the same hormones. And again, and they think of it only as a, um, as a um, woman's hormone. And um, the, um, so, so the thing about progesterone, and they think of it only, I'm sorry, as, as an anti-estrogen hormone. I, yeah. Okay. But actually, what, what is not known to the medical community is that it blocks insulin as well as adrenaline. And, and I suspect that, you know, there are no studies to document this, but just, you know, there's a thing called evidence-based medicine. There's also a thing called observational-based medicine, which is how medicine developed. And I'm, I'm in the, I'm the latter camp. I, I look at observation. And, um, and just the fact that um, how it operates I, I make that statement that it, that it blocks uh, insulin and adrenaline. Um, if you give somebody who has a lot of adrenaline, they're very tense and nervous, and <clears throat> they are shaking up and down, and you give them some progesterone cream, literally within minutes, they're nice and relaxed, and then they can start focusing better right away within minutes. So I know that it blocks adrenaline. 
And, uh, and like I say, uh, when people start using progesterone, they don't get sleep in the afternoon between three and four when insulin normally peaks. They don't get sleep when they're driving. And, you know, there are some people that actually fall asleep when they're driving and they go off the road, hit a tree and kill themselves. So it's an important hormone. It has a lot of very important benefits. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, and plus it prevents every cancer that estrogen causes. Yeah. You know, women, women that have breast cancer, you know, and, and, and they, they look whether they have estrogen receptor site positive cells and progesterone receptor site positive cells. And so if they're progesterone receptor site positive cells, they tell them not to use progesterone. And that's wrong because progesterone actually kills breast cancer cells. It causes what's called apoptosis, which is the suicide of breast cancer cells. So, and, but, you know, the knowledge of hormones in the medical system is, is just almost non, non-existent yeah it's non-existent yeah there's so um, many women that go to their doctor and ask for bioidentical progesterone and are re completely refused it all the time well let's go one step further mm -hmm. okay there are a lot of doctors that will give women progesterone but now they're giving them oral progesterone yes uh you know, like prometrium yep. and and the thing about oral progesterone even though it's bioidentical and it's micronized progesterone but when you take um, progesterone orally, it, 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 gets, uh, it goes straight to the liver and it converts into a different hormone called allopregnanolone, which is not progesterone. So these women are not being protected. You know, they, uh, the only way to have protection from progesterone for the most part is to use it transdermally through the mm -hmm. skin. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Um, um, and lots of people get the Prometrium. I tried it once and no, did not like that one at all. <laughs> well, well, the number one side effect is it makes you sleepy. So that's mm -hmm. why they have women use it at night. But, that, mm -hmm. but it, it makes women sleepy because it's not progesterone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of, I, I find actually a lot of women, I know I was told to use my progesterone cream at nighttime. And I've recommended that to women too, because I've heard it helps people to sleep. But that's, now I'm well, thinking that's because it's blocking the adrenaline. That's exactly right. Yes. It's not yeah. that it's reacting on the GABA receptors in the brain. It's that it's affecting your adrenaline it's, levels. You're, you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, it's best used before eating something before going to sleep. Um, yeah. Yes. I've been, so I've been doing that. That's the, I've been, I just did it last night. I, okay. I, what was it? I think I woke this time it was, I woke up in the middle of the night and usually I don't get back to sleep. So I, I got up and I ate a low glycemic snack and I put some progesterone cream on my, on my forearms and I, okay. I got right back to sleep 10 minutes. And usually it's two hours. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, yeah, and we, we can, we can talk about, you know, how to have, you know, how this whole thing works, but yeah. um, it's a, it's a nice hormone. It's, uh, it's certainly my favorite hormone. Yes, it's mine as well. Yeah. Okay. And more and more so. I'm just like the progesterone advocate now of like, if you're not on progesterone, what are you doing? <laughs> and, but and this is a modern issue, isn't it? Uh, did you say modern issue? It's a modern issue. Like this is not something we would have seen hundreds of years ago in women. I think, I think you're right. I, I think that things are changing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've never, ever had a woman with a normal progesterone level ever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think this is wow. nature's way of maybe cutting down on, um, who knows? Um, yeah, because it's in, they growth. give progesterone to women that are infertile. Which, is, yeah, the number one reason why women cannot get pregnant is low progesterone. The number one reason why they have miscarriages is low progesterone. Uh, you may have heard of women that vomit throughout their entire pregnancy. That was me. I know. I wish I had found you before well, I had okay. my children, Dr. Platt, because I okay. vomited through both my pregnancies the whole time. Well, you only see that in creative type women. Because yeah. they, again, again, creative people had the most adrenaline. Um, you know, we can talk about what constitutes a creative type woman, you know, the yeah. characteristics. Yeah. Um, and, you know, creative people uh, are very intuitive about other people. I'm very intuitive, yes. And they have premonitions and deja vu type yes, feelings. Yes, all the time. <laughs> um, if they go too long without eating, they start getting shaky or irritable. Yes, check. When the, when the phone rings, they'll either know who it is before they answer yes. or, they'll say, or, they'll say, or they'll say, I was just thinking about you. <laughs> and they'll also notice that animals and small children will be very attracted to them. Oh, yeah. And this, <laughs> and, and, you know, this is how clairvoyance and psychics work, by the way. Um, right. 
and also dog whispers and horse whispers. And, and, and it's all attributable to adrenaline, which allows you to tap into the energy that goes through the air. A lot of energy, you know, from cell phones and Wi-Fi and satellites. And you can tap into that energy. That's why you can have premonitions and deja vu type feelings to know who's on the phone. Um, but yeah, but yeah, you know, creative women are the, are the ones that um, not only vomit throughout their entire pregnancy, but when you, you hear about bedwetting in children, you only see that in creative type children, only. Wow. And that's also caused by excess adrenaline. Even colic in babies, you've heard of colic in babies? Yeah. yeah. That's also our friend adrenaline. Yeah. Um, and, is that passed from mother to baby in the womb? Well, w women that are going to have babies that have colic will usually find that these are the babies that kick a lot when they're in the womb. Mm -hmm. And that's adrenaline. And, uh, and the colic is also caused by adrenaline. And rubbing progestin cream on the baby's belly will get rid of it in about three minutes. So you don't have to stay up all night with the baby crying. So I wish saying. I knew that. You should have called me. I know, I'm darn. But, but you know, these little things are completely unknown to the medical community. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah cause you say too, like if a, if a child's bedwetting to use progesterone cream. They can get rid of it in 24 hours instead of having the, the child deal with it for years. They can get rid of it in 24 hours just by lowering adrenaline. Wow, yeah. And I would think that, you know, we've got this epidemic of kids with eight, that are being diagnosed with ADD, ADHD they could just be using progesterone. Well, you know, in, in, in my book, Adrenaline Dominance, I, you know, I, I, I talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly yeah. when it comes to adrenaline. And the only thing in the good section I put is ADHD. And, and the reason for that is that the most intelligent, successful, creative people in the world have ADHD. Yeah. And the most successful people, the ones that have two different types of ADHD. And by, and by that, Oh, you got rid of the cell phone, but you didn't get rid of the other phone. <laughs> Before we started, Dr. Platt got rid of his cell phone, so it wouldn't disrupt <laughs> us. <laughs> of course, that's going to happen. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, the, um, um, the most creative people are, yeah. have the ADHD and, or, or the good type of ADHD. Well, the, um, well, the, 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 what I call a mixed type ADHD is when they have a combination of ADHD and ADD. Now, mm. what, what they refer to as ADD, you know, these are kids that have trouble focusing, but they're not hyperactive. These are the creative type children. And, and, and if people only have a ADD, these are the ones who always have a weight issue because they're putting out a lot of adrenaline, but they're not burning up the sugar that the adrenaline is making. Mm. Kids with ADHD are burning up their sugar and they don't have a weight issue. Right. Yes. People, but when people have a combination of ADD and ADHD, these are the heads of every major corporation. And probably not one of them ever finished college, by the way. And yet they're the yeah, heads right. of corporations. Yeah. Um, so the whole thing about ADHD is not a learning disorder. It's an interest disorder. In other words, yeah, if, if these kids are interested, they will focus. If they're not interested, they will not focus. Yeah. 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 And I love that because I think a lot of parents just go through such hell with their with with the school system and trying to get their child who's got ADHD to kind of fit into the school system and my sister had a child like that and she just eventually pulled him out because he couldn't sit still he couldn't pay attention so she homeschooled him and now he's probably like one of the most incredible athletes he you know dirt bikes mountain bikes skateboards surfs and he's brilliant and he has well, no problem focusing on things that he loves. It, it's like in high school, they have algebra. And, and that's a hard subject for kids that have trouble focusing. Yeah. And once they leave high school, they don't need algebra anymore. So that's a kind of a subject that should be made as an elective rather than as a mandatory. Yeah. But schools don't understand what ADHD is. They just refer to it as a learning disorder, and it's not. Kids with ADHD are very intelligent. They just can't focus because their mind goes so quickly that they get distracted very easily. Yeah. Uh, all doctors have ADHD. All lawyers have ADHD. I just, you know, <laughs> all nutritionists have <laughs> Okay. What do you have, Dr. Pot? Do you, are you ADHD? Oh, 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 oh I, I used to get up and walk out of class. I couldn't focus at all in school. <laughs> But let me tell you something, it wasn't until I got into medical school that I started studying because I was interested in medicine, but mm. there was nothing in high school or college I had any interest in. 
you know, I got by because you study the night before, you don't learn anything. But um, yeah, so it's like I say, it's just say it's a it's a interest disorder. It's not a it's not a learning disorder. Mm -hmm. um, so do you yourself use progesterone cream now? Oh yes. Right. Yes. And yeah. what else do you do? You have testosterone in there. Like, do you are you a person that believes as a person ages to replace what you're missing completely, or just a little bit? Just, just you know where, where it's needed. I I don't replace everything. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, testosterone is actually an important hormone for women. Yeah. Um, the uh, the heart has more testosterone receptor sites than any other muscle in the body. Wow. And and you know the number one cause of death in women is heart attacks. Right. You know, and they occur six times more commonly than any other cause of death. And yeah. but men, even when they're low in testosterone, they're still producing a lot more testosterone than women have. Uh, women are, are very low. So when it comes to replacing hormones in the menopause, I, I think testosterone is an important hormone. Mm -hmm. uh, DHEA might be important because women with the highest DHEA levels have the greatest longevity. Wow. Um, right. Mine have always been low. That's, I'm going to die early then. <laughs> well, but it's replacing it. It's, I'm replacing it. I got some okay. replacing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm um, working on it. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Um, but, but you are and, a proponent of like higher higher amounts of the progesterone though, because I found that most people, most doctors, functional medicine people, books I've read, it's kind of the, the standard recommendation would be about 50 milligrams. Um, and you're upwards of 100, 150. Well, actually I start people on 200 milligrams. Yeah. Um, it's 50, well, the, the uh, 50 milligrams is the strength you need to block adrenaline. Okay. And, that, and that's a 5% progesterone cream. And, uh, but so when I first are uh, treating people, I have them start with uh, four times a day. Um, you know, I, I have them use it before meals. And, and the reason why before meals, as soon as people put food in their mouth, the body's putting out insulin. Yeah. And when insulin levels go up, blood sugar drops. So when blood sugar drops, the body puts out more adrenaline to raise the sugar level back up again. So one of the ways of controlling adrenaline is to control insulin. So that's why before meals, um, and I have people use it before a snack, before going to sleep, if, if they're waking up during the night. And, um, and the snack, you, you know, and basically what you wanna do for people who wanna control adrenaline, um, they have to treat the reason why the body's putting out adrenaline. And, and <clears throat> what makes it very simple, there's only two reasons why the body releases adrenaline. You know, one is if you're in danger. Yeah. Okay, but <clears throat> that's a very rare reason why the body puts out adrenaline. But the most common reason the body puts out adrenaline is to raise sugar levels for the brain. So uh, the, the sugar that the brain uses is glucose. And I wish I could say that candy and soda was the best sources, <laughs> but actually uh, vegetables, vegetables are the best source of glucose for the brain because they don't produce a lot of insulin. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other fuel, which may be even more important are ketones. And a lot of your, your listeners, I'm sure have heard of the ketogenic diet, but you don't have to be on a ketogenic diet to get ketones, uh, coconut oil and MCT oil. And coconut oil is better for cooking because it has a very high heat threshold. And MCT oil is better for adding to food, you know, like bulletproof coffee, if you will, or mm -hmm. um, put, adding it to yogurt. Or, or You can add it to salad dressing with vinegar. You can add MCT oil to anything, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the, so the two fuels for the brain, glucose and ketones. And once you're doing that and using progesterone cream, basically within 24 hours, you can get a significant drop in adrenaline. You know, for example, road rage which is only caused by excess adrenaline, uh, that you get rid of that in 24 hours. Bedwetting, you get rid of in 24 hours, you know, by eating correctly and using, you know. So. Um, Do you keep using it like that? Well, um, you know, everybody's different. You know, for mm -hmm. example, like, some people believe, you know, do a lot of exercise. You know, I, I walk to my car, that's why I exercise. But a lot, of, a lot of people are very much into exercise and they have to realize that their muscles are burning up the same fuel the brain uses, you know, which is glucose. So if the people are doing a lot of exercise, they have to replace that or the body will be, they'll be living on adrenaline. So everybody's a little bit different from what mm -hmm. their needs are. 
-hmm. and their body will tell them what they need. Right. Yeah. Trust me on that one. <laughs> yeah, just because we'll get to the point like you could start using it, say, at the 200 a day, and then we'll get to the point where your body says, okay, that's too much now, and there's a side effect of too much of the progesterone. I know in the past I've had, and, and you're the only person I've ever seen talk about this, is when I've used too much, I, I start, I get weepy, like I can't control it. I just cry and cry and cry. And you talk about that in your book as being well, maybe pent up anger. <laughs> I think it was. Well, I think I think, I think I think it's more a relief of getting rid of that anger, actually. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. I thought um, that was amazing. So have you seen that go away with the continued use of that high the, amount? Well, for, for, let me start it by saying that basically there are no side effects to, to excess adrenaline. Um, you can't overdose on it. To progesterone, it, you mean? To yeah, oh, you said I, adrenaline. I didn't mean to say that. I <laughs> like, yes, there is side effects to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Basically, there are no side effects from, from progesterone, and you, you can't overdose on it. You can run out of it, but you can't overdose on it. However, there is one instance where it can create problems. <clears throat> um, you know, people have heard of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, but there's also, as you may know, is a type 3 diabetes. Yeah, right. And type 3 diabetes is insulin resistance in the brain. And what that means is that the insulin in the brain has a real hard time getting glucose into the brain cells. And this is probably the number one predisposing factor to Alzheimer's. So it's an important condition to, to be aware of. Unfortunately, there's no test for it. However, there really is a test for it because if people have insulin resistance in the brain and they use progesterone, right away, I mean, right away within minutes, they'll have an increase in adrenaline. And uh, because again, the body recognized it has an even a harder time trying to get glucose into the brain cells. So to start putting out even more adrenaline to raise the glucose level. So, um, so if people start using progesterone, all of a sudden they, they have more anxiety, they have palpitations, they get more anger right away. Um, that tells them that their brain has insulin resistance. And the, see, the thing about progesterone, one of its functions is that it does cause insulin resistance, which is a good thing because it prevents people from getting sleepy. But when people already have insulin resistance of the brain to begin with and use progesterone, that makes it worse. So what's nice about this is that if they do have type 3 diabetes, the whole nice thing about Alzheimer's, it's, it's a disease of prevention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if this is the case, then they know they have to start using MCT oil or coconut oil every day, and that will prevent them from getting Alzheimer's. Right. Because um, because ketones go directly into the brain; they don't need insulin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so aside from that one little thing <laughs> problem, um, there are no downsides to progesterone. Um, wow. And and when it comes to treating children, it's the same dose, 50 milligrams to block adrenaline. Now, keep in mind, you know, for example, you know, babies with colic, you know, same dose, uh, one whole pump. When the baby, when the fetus is in the womb, it gets exposed to incredibly high levels of progesterone. I mean, mm -hmm. levels that cannot be duplicated. Mm -hmm. So if the fetus can tolerate that amount of progesterone, well, why <clears throat> certainly children can also. Uh, and it's not a sex hormone even though it increases libido in women, but it's not a sex hormone. So it's not going to affect, you know, children, you know, when they're going through puberty, it won't affect them one way or the other from that standpoint. So Can it raise cortisol too much? I've heard that before and I don't believe it. Because well, I know it's a it, precursor to cortisol. It is. It, it can downregulate into cortisol, but I've yeah. never seen that happen. No, I haven't either. In fact, I think, I think it they, helps. If, if anything, it probably lowers cortisol because mm -hmm. it reduces adrenaline. Mm, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I would think so. And it gets women's progesterone levels, I think, are, are was one of the reasons why there's why we see it so much being so low is that their cortisol is called constantly going up, which I think is as well now adrenaline. That could be it's like sucking out all the progesterone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> like it's just using it up. Can that is that possible? I don't. Well, no, uh, I don't think so. I, I, I think, um, I, I think the, the, the primary reason why women or anybody else has a low progesterone, it, it's all genetic. You know, people inherit hormones from their parents. Ah. You know, for example, if you have a child with ADHD, then one or both parents have ADHD. Um, 
the parents may not realize that, but they, but, but adrenaline is inherited one way or the other. It's inherited. Uh, okay. So. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm amazing. Well, this, that's a lot to, a lot to take in and I love it. Now you well, sell progesterone and I've been sending my clients there now because I figured you're probably uh, going to be a trusted source when it comes to progesterone cream. Well, are you? Well, you're in charge of my marketing for now. <laughs> Yeah, we have we have we have an excellent five percent progesterone cream, and yeah, um, and um, we also have, have a therapeutic strength of estriol, but whatever. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. but you is that mostly for women that are? It's only for women. Yeah. In in menopause or perimenopausal as well. Just well, if they're a, having those experiences of dry vagina, and then they can use it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, my pharmacist gave me, because my estradiol was so low, but my progesterone was still lower. So in comparison, it was still off. But they, yeah, my functional, my naturopath had given me, I think it was like 25% estradiol and the rest estriol, but you would still say no to that, wouldn't you? Well, actually, you know, when they talk about biased, which means two, est two, two different types of estrogen, it's a combination of estriol and estradiol. Mm -hmm. And normally the estriol is 80% and the estradiol is 20%. Yeah, so that I think was that's close. what it was. No, I think that was, that's, it was something like that. So, yeah. But like I say, I'm not a big fan of estradiol. So, <laughs> well, I'm just saying, unless women are trying to create more fat, you know, it's a, it's a yeah, lipogenic no. hormone. No, 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 no. Oh. definitely not trying to create more fat. No one, no one listening to the podcast is going to be trying to create more fat. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, est estrogen puts on fat around the hips, the thighs, and buttocks. Right. Uh, insulin puts on fat around the middle. <clears throat> A low thyroid puts on fat everywhere. So mm. cortisol, the stomach as well. Yeah, right? it's a, it High raises, cortisol. Yeah, it raises glu glucose levels. So that would be the stomach. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, so oh. you guys can head on over to what's to give us your website name. It's well, it's called Platt Wellness, P L A T T Platt Wellness dot com, and it's um, yeah, www.platwellness dot com. Yeah. Now, now you don't ship to Canada though, do you, Doctor Platt? Actually, we do. Oh, oh, even the progesterone. Yes, we ship it as a as a body cream not as a hormone cream. Perfect. Oh, that's so good to know. Okay. Cause uh, I, I'm always looking for trusted sources. And so if you do that, that's a great, and you've got lavender in it too, which I thought was well, nice. <laughs> well, well we have it with or without lavender, actually, yeah. but two different names, but um, so the, those who prefer not to have the essential oil of lavender, we have it just plain. And by the way, progressive good for dogs also. Yeah. How does uh, it help dogs? Well, there are some dogs that have separation anxiety and some dogs that are aggressive and some dogs have asthma and some dogs have, have seizure disorders. Um, some dogs are afraid of thunder or lightning. You know, this is all actually related to adrenaline, but it goes inside the ear. Uh, oh. it's, it's like skin inside the ear and it gets absorbed very quickly. So within about 30 seconds, those dogs with separation anxiety will, will lie down and go to sleep. Oh, wow. And so where do, where is your recommendation for uh, women to put it on as far as, because I've heard that it's more absorbable in the thighs, but then I hear, no, nope, thin skin's better. So what's your take on that? Okay. Basically, you want it in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the most effective area to put it is actually on the forearms. And you, you put a pump on one forearm, you rub the two forearms together. Now, people with excess adrenaline almost always carry tension in the neck almost always. And, and when you have a lot of tension in the neck, this can actually cut off blood supply to the ears, and that's where tinnitus comes from. And it can cause headaches, you know. And, and I, I would like to mention, you know, a lot of women, or so a lot of people, but especially women, complain about migraine headaches. Yes, I have them. And, and let me tell you something. I've been in practice for a long time, a long time. Yes. And I have never had a patient that actually had a migraine headache. But, um, I, there's another type of headache that's always mistaken for a migraine headache, and it's called occipital neuritis. Occipital neuritis. It comes from the occipital nerve sheath at the base of the skull. It causes excruciating headaches. That's why they're mistaken for migraines. And very often they shoot right into the back of the eye. They can cause a visual field defect. Anyway, they're only caused by excess adrenaline. And these headaches are so easy to get rid of. You just put progesterone cream on the back of the neck, they're gone. So you can prevent them or you can el eliminate them just by putting cream on the back of the neck. 
Mm-hmm. So, so people with extra tension, that's a good place to put it. People with restless leg syndrome, um, they apply the progesterone cream to the top of the thighs and massage it in. People with cramps, <clears throat> cramps in their in their calves or their feet, massage it into the calves or the feet. It goes away in about thirty seconds. Um, wow! So yeah, and then diet wise, it's just. Um, which on here, I'm always, a, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, low sugar, lower carb diet. So a paleo based diet where you're getting lots of vegetables, some good healthy meats and fats. And, but you, your thing is like, keep that blood sugar steady. Hey. Right. Um, an ideal breakfast uh, would be a scrambled eggs cooked in coconut oil and put on a bed of spinach. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they could have sausage and bacon along with that, but basically, um, you know, they get the glucose from the uh, from the spinach, and they get the ketones from the coconut oil. Um, they could also have a green smoothie, of course, with coconut or MCT oil. A lot of people put, you know, MCT oil or coconut oil in their coffee. Right? I do, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I actually don't ever tell. You, of course, fasting is all the rage right now, and I have fasting in in most of my programs, but I always have it with. Um, a call it like a bulletproof coffee with the MCT and coconut oil or butter uh, in order to help with the adrenaline. I've always said that like with adrenaline and cortisol, you the fasting can be really hard, especially for women. I find. Um, yes. Um, and another, you know, vegetables are the best source of glucose and what they may want to consider are sweet potatoes, but mm-hmm. instead of, instead of baking them, have them slice it up and, and, and fry it in coconut oil. Delicious. Yeah. A and, sprinkle of cinnamon. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Platt. I'd love to have you back on again to dive farther into the hormone side of things because okay. I think it's, uh, I think you're brilliant. I love all your books. Uh, I've been recommending them to everybody and I now have a trusted source for progesterone cream, which makes me very happy. So, Well, if you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, if they're interested, you know, my book, Adrenaline Dominance, uh, it's on Amazon. Yes, I'm going to be, I've got all in the show notes, you guys will have all the links to his books, his website, and the progesterone cream so that you know exactly where to go and get it. It's not just the book on adrenaline dominance. I'm also, I also have his book, The Miracle of Bioidentical Hormones, which I find is really good, really easy for anybody to read. It's not too sciencey. He gives lots of uh, patient stories in it that you can relate to and how he helped them. So I, if you're, if you're suffering with hormone imbalance, which most of you are, just so you know, FYI, most of you are, <laughs> um, getting his books is great. They're, they're easy reads. They're not, like I said, they're not too sciencey. You can understand it. So I'd highly recommend um, checking it out. So okay. thank you so much, Dr. Platt. It's been my pleasure.